And uh, today, we are starting a new study in the book of Proverbs. And we just wrapped up last week our study in time through the book of Genesis. And that was a really great time to get to know some of the famous people in the Bible and uh, how we got to where we are from creation to sin through the flood to Abraham all the way down his line to Joseph. And now we're in the book of Proverbs and the book of Proverbs functions a little bit differently than most books of the Bible. And our pattern has been to kind of follow the book chronologically and to see where it takes us. With Proverbs, in order to stick on a topic, you kind of have to bounce around a little bit. And so we're going to try and help you out up here on the screen, but uh, we always encourage you to follow along in your Bible. And today you won't be doing too much bouncing around. But if you would turn with me to Proverbs chapter 13. That's where we're going to land today. Proverbs 13, verse 12. And it says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled as a tree of life. And if you're following along on your outline, as I always encourage you to do, the first point on there is hope deferred makes the heart sick. And today what I want to talk about is what do we do when the promises in our life, the promises that ultimately that God has given to us, but even in relationship to human promises, what do we do when those promises in our life are at best partially fulfilled? When we look at our life and the things that God has promised or other people have promised, what do we do when the things in our life are not matching up with what we believe to be the promises? Because this verse says very clearly that hope deferred, getting our hopes up and having our hopes dashed can make our hearts sick. And so what do we do in those times? And we can look back in our childhood or maybe even in the present, hopefully not too present, when somebody has made a promise, and it could be as simple as, you know, hey, after the game, we're going to go get ice cream from mom and dad. And then after the game, something happens and no ice cream. And it can go on to even greater things. I thought I was going to be in a different place in my life. They kind of promised me if I got a degree and I worked hard in school that... I'd have a good job, and I don't. But it gets even worse when those promises we believe have come from God. When we read in his word and we read about answered prayer and we read about, you know, maybe feeling like God has said if you put your money in a certain way that there would be financial success there. Maybe if you invest in relationships a certain way that you would have a good marriage. Many different things that this could apply and you feel when you look at your life it doesn't really match up with what you feel that the word of God says. What do you do when you've gotten your hopes up and then time after time after time had your hopes just kind of dashed and you're left waiting and hoping. Some people's reaction is just to say, I'm just not going to get my hopes up anymore. I'm just not going to dream anymore. I'm not going to imagine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hope anymore. I've had that happen too many times in my life where you know, people have made a promise and they've let me down, and so I'm just not going to trust. I'm not going to expect. I'm not going to hope. I'm not going to wait for good things to happen anymore. And I want you to turn with me to a story in the book of 2 Kings. Chapter 4. And we're going to pick up in the story of Elisha and the Shunammite woman. And Elisha was an interesting character. He's fun to read. He was the protege of a man named Elijah. And when Elijah got taken up into heaven, before he left, Elisha asked, Can I have a double portion of your spirit? Can I have the mantle of your role upon me? 
And Elijah says, well, I don't know if I can grant that, but, you know, if a certain thing happens when I go up into the sky, then it'll be yours. And that happens. And indeed, you see some pretty amazing things happen in the life of Elisha. Many miracles that God performs through him, and this is just one of him, one of them, but it follows along with what we're talking about today. And so in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, it says, One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman, meaning she had a lot of money, she had a nice place, was there. And she urged him to stay for a meal, so whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. And so she said to her husband, I know that this man, who often comes our way, is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put, it, put in it a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. So, hey, this guy's been coming along every once in a while. Let's set up a little bed and breakfast, a little guest room. And so when he comes by, he can stay the night, and he can stay with us a little longer. And it says, one day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. And he said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she replied, I have a home among my own people. So her, her response is, I'm, I'm fine. You don't need to do anything for me. I'm with my husband. I love my family. We got a nice place. We're, we're good. But Elisha really wanted to, to bless her. He wanted, really wanted to do something for her. And you, you've had that friend before. You say, hey, what do you want for your birthday? And they say, ah, I don't need anything. In fact, I don't even really even celebrate my birthday. And so then you go, no, that's not good enough. So I'm going to go to their friends. I'm going to do a little research. I'm going to follow them around for a little while. And I'm going to find out what they are into so that I can get them something to bless them because they've been so good to me. Well, that's exactly what Elisha does. And he says to his servant Gehazi, what can be done for her? And Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Gehazi had a little insight from God into this woman and uh, maybe he's just had personal conversation in the past and says, well, one thing she did not mention is that she's really wanted a son. She's really wanted her, won her whole life, and nothing's really ever happened there. And now her husband's too old. She's kind of given up hope, and she doesn't even bring it up anymore because she, she doesn't even think it's a possibility. And so in verse 15, and Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold the son in your arms. And here's her response. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. Her response was, you know, you're going to have a kid. That thing you've been hoping for, it never happened for you. We're going to make it happen. God is going to bless you with the child. And she says, don't even tell me that. I've had my hopes up about this so many times, it looked like it was going to happen, I believed it was going to happen, and it didn't happen. And now my husband's old, and we're past the child, I've moved past this, I'm moving on with my life, I'm okay with it, don't even get my hopes up, don't go there. In verse 17, but the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out with his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to my, his father. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. So typical dad, something happens, you're messing around a little bit too much, gets hurt, go see your mom. Verse 20. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door and went out. 
She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. Now, typical marriage. Something significant has happened, and they've yet to communicate about it. Go get me a donkey. Why are you going to go today? What, you know, kind of ignoring the real issue here. And the woman keeps on saying this throughout this passage. It's all right. It's going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. Everything's going to work out. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be just fine. I'm going to be just fine. She keeps on saying it as if she's talking herself into it. Everything's not fine. But she keeps on trying to talk herself into it and talk, is just say every, to everybody else, okay, I'm okay. Verse 24, she saddled the donkey and said to her servants, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. It's not a symbol of something that everything's all right. When you fall to the ground and you grab onto somebody's feet, everything's not okay. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, for the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said. Didn't I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. Essentially, she was fine. He makes a promise. The promise comes true. And then the boy grows up and he dies. So now, what do you do with that? What do you do when you get your hopes up and your hopes are fulfilled and then they come dashing down to the ground? She basically returns to sender. She goes to the man of God and says, hey, I did not ask you for this. This was your idea. You make it right. And Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. If anyone greets you, don't answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. So Elisha, he's kind of a busy guy, and so he sends his servant. He says, take my staff. If you want to know the story behind the staff, you need to go some chapters beforehand. And so the woman says, no, uh-uh, no, not this time. Your stick isn't going to be good enough. You're coming with me, and you're going to pray for my boy. This was your idea. You're going to make it right. So verse 31. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told them, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. So the first attempt is the stick, the staff. That doesn't work. Second attempt, he goes into the room, closes the door, and he prays. Nothing happens. Verse 34. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Grew warm, but he's still dead. That's the third attempt. Verse 35, Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. And the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. So the fourth attempt is he lays out on the boy and then he goes, okay, well, that didn't work. And so he's kind of pacing, and he's praying, and he's walking back and forth. And God, you know, you, you told me to make this promise and this boy was born. It was a miracle and you, you, you gave it to her. And then 
grows up and he dies and this horrible thing has happened and now she's heartbroken and Father, I can't go out of this room without this boy being alive because she's going to kill me. You ever prayed those kind of prayers? Just kind of pacing back and forth. You don't know what to do. So that's the fourth attempt. And then the fifth attempt, he does what he did the third time. He lays down on the boy again, stretches himself out, and he prays. And this time, the boy comes to life. And the Bible wants to let you know that he sneezed seven times. I've told you before that nothing's there by accident. And we'll get to that later. Verse 36. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. And he did. And when she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. What I want you to know today is that if you are feeling let down in any way, shape, or form by humans, by God even, and you're feeling like the promises of God are not just coming full form in your life, you're not alone. You're not alone. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, after it goes and talks about all of these characters, it's called the hall of faith. And you talk about, you know, Adam and Noah and Moses and Abraham and Isaac and all these guys in the Old Testament. It says in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. One thing you need to hear in this is that believers don't just die. They die in faith. They die believing because we're called believers. And that's kind of what a believer does is we believe and we hope and we trust. We have faith. We keep going. We keep on patiently, persistently going, believing, hoping, dreaming. Even until the point of death. And then sometimes and many times actually, there's things that are left undone. Things that you've been working towards in your life that are not going to necessarily reach their climax fulfillment with you. All of these guys, we take Abraham for existence, we, we look to him and God says, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you, Abraham. Your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky, the dust of the earth. And he's like 100 years old before he has his first kid. And then he doesn't like really own anything. He's kind of a nomad. He's moving from place to place, and he has this land where he is, and he, he seems to be doing fairly well, but definitely not what God had promised him. And it's not an unstrange thing if you're reading the Old Testament. It kind of just flows for us as we're reading it. We don't realize many, many years and generations pass in between the promise and fulfillment of the promise. And oftentimes what happens is that it's not in their life, it's in the life of their son, the life of their grandson, the life of their great, 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 great grandson. But the promise ultimately comes to fulfillment. And that ultimately it says that this was not their home. Abraham, he was believing in a promise about a land. But ultimately, the land he was looking for was not on this earth, it was heaven. We are not the promiser, we're the promisee. And sometimes when things aren't going right in our life, we kind of put, just put the, the guilt or the shame or the frustration on ourselves, and we're thinking, oh my gosh, what do I have to do? What can I do better? What can I strive for? What can I work on that can make this thing happen? I need, I need to save more money. I need to do more. I need to go back to college. I need to do stuff. Because this doesn't seem to be working. And the, the ownness of the promise is on God. When you read in the Word and you read a promise that God has given you in your quiet time, in your own personal relationship with God, when God speaks into your life, when He calls you, to do something. We've said it many times that if we obey God, we need to leave the consequences to Him. 
Because when God speaks, he fully takes accountability and responsibility for the consequences that are going to come as a result. And this is exactly what the Shunammite woman does, isn't it? God had made a promise into her life. You're going to have a son. And she even warned him. Hey, I didn't ask for this. Don't get my hopes up. And then it comes, and then the boy dies. What does she do? She takes it back to the one who promised it. Man of God, you made this promise to me. I didn't ask you for this. You need to make it right. We're not the promiser. We're the promisee. One of the things that we need to do is to not stop embracing what is afar off. You know, in the Hebrews verse, it says that all these guys, they died without receiving the thing that was promised them. And you're not going to see them in heaven just walking around going, man, did we waste our time. God promised this thing and we worked so hard and we believed and we believed and we lived our life in faithful obedience to God, believing that this thing was going to happen, and then it doesn't happen. No, they're looking down and they have the perspective of God and they see how it was fulfilled in the life of their kid and their grandkid. Even thousands of years down the road, how is the direct result of their obedience, they're part of the chain that ultimately brought Jesus, who died for our sins and rose again from the dead and secured the very place in heaven where they now live. Don't stop embracing what's afar off. And no doubt, many of us in this room have been dealing with disappointment, or we have dealt with disappointment. People that have let us down, or given the feeling that, God, where are you? Where are you? And where is all this stuff that you promised? Don't give up hope. Keep believing. Keep obeying. And he will bring it to pass. Because he's faithful. But ultimately, it's not about your promise. It's about Jesus. You know, I, I have said that the Bible doesn't put anything there by accident. Sometimes you read it and go, that is a weird detail to include. The boy sneezed seven times. Who cares? Why the fifth try and seven sneezes? I don't know if you've ever done this before. Have you ever heard about this? you heard about different numbers meaning different things. Basically, what people do is they take a concordance, which is a book that lists every time a word is used in the Bible. You can access a lot of them online for free. And you just punch in the word five, the word seven, and see how the Holy Spirit uses it in his word. Nothing's there by accident. Seven is the number of perfection or completion. And there actually turns out to be seven supernatural births in the Old Testament, and this is the seventh one. Which means that this was pointing to the ultimate son. It wasn't pointing really to her son. It wasn't about her son. It was about the son. And five is the number of grace. In the Bible. You know why your body sneezes? Your body sneezes to expel irritants from the body system. And contrary to popular belief, your spirit does not come out of your nose when you sneeze. And so we do not need to say, God bless you. But it's a nice thing to say. It, it, we sneeze because there's something that has come into the body that we need to get rid of. So your body, with mighty forces, boom, gets it out. 
And ultimately, this promise and this whole story was not about her son. It wasn't about the promise that God made to her. It was about the promise of the son. Want me to prove it to you? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Some other translations put it this way. All of the promises in Jesus are yes and amen. What that means is that every single promise that God has made throughout his word in your life, every single time he speaks, it is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus and what he has done. If you have Jesus, you have the fulfillment, the sum, and the substance of every single one of God's promises to you. We need to hear that. Because it's not that God doesn't want to work in your life. It's not that God doesn't want to answer your prayers. It's not any of those things. It's not that God wants to dash your hopes to the ground. He want, wants to make it difficult on you. It's that ultimately, in spite of all of that, what works out, what doesn't work out, what gets fulfilled, what doesn't get fulfilled, ultimately it's about Jesus. And if you have him, you have everything. He is the sum and he is the substance of every single one of God's promises. What that means is when you do have something that happens in your life and you're let down, your hope is dashed. What we're called to do in this, just like the Shunammite woman, is to take up the sun. We're called to embrace Jesus, to hold on to him, because he is the sum and the substance of everything that God wants to have happen in your life, in your children's life, in your grandchildren's life, and on and on it goes. So, as the praise team comes forward, I'm going to pray for you guys. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you took the, the trouble and the time to communicate with us and to reveal to us who you are and everything that we need to know about you, about us, about what you have asked us to do. Everything is revealed to us in your word. And you have made so many countless promises to us, Father, in your word. And you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing that we, there is in Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you that the answer to all of your promises are yes in Jesus. And that ultimately, ultimately that when we go beyond this life, that we go up into heaven for all of eternity be with you, that there will be no regrets, there will be no looking back and wishing that we had more. That, Father, you are the sum and substance of everything that we could hope for, dream for. And, Father, I do want to pray for those who have had their hope dashed and cut down in this room. And I pray, Father, that for those who have kind of just said, I'm not going to give, I'm going to give up hope. I, I'm not going to dream anymore. I'm not going to hope anymore. I'm not going to believe for great things to happen pray, Father, that you would renew their resolve. That you would have them embrace you and hold tight to you. And not let you go. And that they would embrace every single thing that you have promised them. And that their strength would be renewed. And I want to pray particularly for those who Maybe the promise that hasn't been fulfilled is there's somebody that they love that has not placed their faith in Jesus. I pray, Father, that they would not give up hope, that they would pray with 
greater fervency than they ever have before. That they would pursue that individual with more love than they ever have before. And Father, we pray that those that we love would come into your kingdom. That we would experience the joy of being a part of you using us for that purpose. Father, for all the other things, all the little details of life, we pray, Father, that you would hear our prayers as you always promise that you do, and that you would be found faithful in our lives as we are found faithful to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.